Says, get that India, big boy. Hello and welcome back to another edition of the Tip Sheet Podcast. As always, I'm your host, John, also known as 4020. Joining me for an instant reaction from the round 17 fixture against Newcastle Knights is my good mate, 60s big fella. Uh, probably one of the more controversial games that we're going to cover uh, in this season, or even in our time as a tip sheet, honestly. Uh, Eels going down by 8 points, 34 to 26 to the Novocastrians in one of, and I do not exaggerate here, one of the worst officiated games I have seen in the NRL era. Big fella, frustrating one. How you doing on a day where the Eels had three games against the Knights in a can only come away, sorry, with the one result in the New South Wales Cup? Well, first of all, can I say I really hate doing instant reactions after a loss. We, we're we not here just for the good times, although we much prefer the good times. But, man, that was – look, the neutrals might have loved watching a game like that. I hated it. I absolutely hated it because there was a, there was a mix of three things happening – in that game, number one, Parramatta having moments of shooting themselves. Yeah, the we foot. we clearly bumbled it at the end. Don't get me wrong, but yeah, uh, yeah. Number two, um, a decent slice of luck avoiding us, and number three, some of the worst um, bunker calls and officiating that that I've seen for a while. Now, obviously, I'm going to be looking at this through biased eyes and. And uh, look, I would say there was one call that we got that was lucky, which was that uh, the short restart. restart. Yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. touches of the no. ice pad on here, but the rest of the game had very much this kind of energy. Oh, you can't be serious, man. You cannot be serious. It was literally John McEnroe the game. Oh, it, it, look, how on earth that uh, the call on Sevo was made, and and you said you could live with that. At, but it was the the fact that it was sent up a no try. Well, yeah, see, see if it goes Bradman up a no try. Exactly. Fair enough, because it, it was very tight, and maybe the ball got there, it was tight. If it, if it gets a water try, probably not overturned. But the Bradman best try where he clearly never got the ball anywhere near the end goals, instantly goes up a try. And Nari Tawala has a, a at the end of a game, like that. how was that that was allowed to play on in any way whatsoever is insanity to me, let alone going up a try where he's either tackled on the ground or there's a clear knock on. And the referee's like, no, play on. And then you've got multiple high shots missed. You've got Blaze Talungi's try being overturned when the ball was clearly on the line and they ruled that he's rolled the ball forwards despite maintaining possession. Uh, then you had Mike Acevo passing the ball back into the field of play and it being ruled a knock on, which is they're not allowed to do that. Like if it's if it's a pass, you cannot rule a knock on. And there was, I don't yeah. think we scored off that one, but it would have been a line dropout. Uh, and that goes on top of a, a ton of other calls. Like I said, multiple missed high shots. The Knights had a ton of forward passes. The Eels did bene- uh, were the benefactors of that bizarre no call on the short restart. Uh, but there were so many bad calls in this one, so many. I mean, Guffo getting taken out by the ref and that not getting considered by the bunker. Uh, and again, the referee, the referee did not need to be backing up in that situation. He had the angle already, but he kept going back into the fullback's line of uh, attack. Uh, a lot of bad calls in that one. One of the worst officiated games I've ever seen to the point where, uh, you know, and it's the heat of the moment stuff, don't get me wrong, but you're really blurring the line between incompetence and something else when it's that bad. And you, you hate to see games get to that point because the best case scenario is the ref is completely out of their depth. That's the best case scenario. Well, I'm going to remember the name Wyatt Raymond from up the fellow up in the box because... That was a very, very ordinary uh, performance, I thought, from up in the bunker. Um, look, again, I'm, I'm, the bottom line still is the Eels have forgotten how to win games because the, the a couple of the, the plays towards the end, and especially, unfortunately, the play from our captain on the last play of the match where, well, the sec, the... What, what what amounted play. to the last play of the game, the last meaningful yeah. play, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
the 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 Parramatta's last shot at it, where you know, unfortunately, Gutho pretty much froze in in that instance. So that was really ordinary. But before we go on any further, yeah, I was about to uh, say, let's, <laughs> let's, let's let's thank our sponsor, Star Real Estate, uh, Star Partners Real Estate, Auburn, Norellan, and Parramatta, and uh, they're they're sticking with us in what is a really really tough season where I think I think it's fair to say that even with everything in this game and the things that the Eels did wrong, um, there was no shortage of effort. No, no. That, and that's what makes, in a way, it almost makes it even more frustrating, doesn't it, 60s, is that the players clearly busted their guts this week. They came out, it was a milestone game, Matt Arthur on debut, and the boys didn't want to let him down. They played... A, they didn't play flawlessly, but they played their backsides off and a, a string of bad calls, then some bad decisions on their own behalf, uh, you know, all compounding against a team that recaptured a bit of form because Newcastle had been playing the last month of football, probably get rolled by the Parramatta Eagles effort tonight. But the, oh, yeah. the yeah. Knights obviously turned up for this one, turned it around, played some good football of their own. And, you know, when you mix all those different factors together, you get the result that we saw Parramatta going down by eight points, um, you know, not to harp back on the referee, but you know, you think of another thing that happened. There was a knock on that was clear from into a night and offside position. At, I think it was twenty all. Eels would have had the chance to go up by two points at that point in the game. Uh, lots of I know I'm like looping back and forth on the officiating, but it was that bad. But yeah, this will be. Well, uh, you know what, mate? Can I just stop you there? It, it was it was led into perfectly in the curtain raiser. Oh, where I, I saw <laughs> diabolical ref, and you wonder why the NRL refs don't get dropped. Anyone that had New South Wales Rugby League TV would have seen the Eels absolutely dominate in the cup, and and also bear witness to uh, an absolutely you know ordinary. You know, again, talking very kindly, ordinary officiating performance. Well, somehow the officials um, found a line ball pass from the Eels to be a forward pass and some of the most uh, blatant forward passes, blatant. I mean, look, the Eels won the game. And won comfortably. But but it was just, the the forward passes were diabolical. There was one, there was one there and the the Eels managed to stop the try. But I guarantee it it was thrown five metres forward. And I think the other one, which did lead to a try, um, was the, the ball was thrown in a forward direction um, straight out of the hands to the support player. It was, oh, yeah. Anyway, but, uh, <sighs> I don't want to go on too much about the referees because it's it's still a case of, you know, we haven't been good enough. No, and absolutely. Look, the, the, the manic moments in the final 12 or so minutes absolutely compound the situation. Despite all the setbacks from the officials, the Eels were still in a position to win that one. And they, you know, bottled it. They they had a couple of bad plays, a couple of, you know, we, we saw Will Penasini and Bla- uh, Blaise Talani get it wrong down the right edge in what could have been a, a big try uh, that ended up being a 12-point turnaround. And then, obviously, you had we, we spoke about Guffo just before, but the same stuff where he gets lost on the last play, of the, what, what amounted to the last play of the game for the Parramatta Eels, tries to force a loopy offload that Will Penasini was never going to be able to pick up cleanly. Uh, and it leads to, again, Bradman Best in the right time, at the right, or right place at the right time to score two of the easiest tries. He'll do a bit of running, but two of the easiest tries he was ever going to score. So, yeah, very frustrating in that regard. But there, as we said before, 60s, this was not a, a case of all bad for the Parramatta Eels. Yes, you can argue they've forgotten how to win. And yes, you can grumble about the referee until the sun comes up. But... There were good things in this game, including the debut of Matt Arthur, who came off the bench, and Trent Barrett didn't uh, hold him back. You know, didn't save him for the last ten minutes to get a cursory taste of first grade. He threw him in before half time, which is exactly what we were asking him to do, and he got to play deep into the second half until it was uh, less than twenty minutes to go, I believe. So he ended up getting close to half an hour of play time, uh, or thereabouts, and he didn't look like he was out of a uh, out of sorts in first grade. Made his tackles, forced some errors. Had a couple of good runs, gave good service to Moses and Brown. It was a and he nearly scored a try too. Had to had a tough sort of scoop and score opportunity of a deflected Mitchell Moses kick, and that's probably the only real blemish on what was otherwise a fantastic individual debut. Yeah, yeah, it, it was, and uh, and you'd have to say as well, Mitch Moses had a cracking game. Um, 
I thought our uh, our front rowers were were back in form. Um, you know, a couple of players probably didn't have their be- best game. I don't think Will Penasini had a great game. Um, I haven't seen, I haven't seen the stats. I might have a bit of a, a, a quick look at the stats, but um, you know, I don't know. How, how did you see Sean Lane's game? I thought he ran the ball reasonably well, but again, we saw another situation where it wasn't his fault that there was an errant offload but the ball was offloaded in his vicinity, trickles near him, and he makes no effort to play it, and it resulted in the Knights scooping the ball up in a Parramatta attacking opportunity, and it's just that lack of hustle that yeah. for for a guy that is riding a thin line in my books, like if I'm in a position of selecting the team, uh, they're the sort of things that very quickly put you behind. And given that we saw someone like Matt Dury come on and have a bit of impact off the bench, uh, I know the Eels are a bit skinny at edge forward now with the injury to Kelmatore Lungy, but, geez, he, the margin of error for him is so razor thin, in, in my opinion, and he, you can't be doing that sort of thing. But I thought, uh, you know, the back line were productive. I thought Mike Acevo had one of a, his better games, honestly, with some really... Yeah, and, uh, but, you know, are we going to see him again now? Well, the, the problem was, yeah, uh, he got shoulder charged by Kai Pierce Paul and then tweaked his hemi, it looked like, which is very unfortunate. Because that also means that issue that's been his issue. Yeah, too, it's, it? yeah, a bit of uh, durability issues recently, and that of course the cascading effect of that means that Sean Russell, who looked good at left centre for the most part, now has to go back to the wing, and it just causes all these different trickle down issues. But I thought the halves were good. Brown and Moses had uh, great moments both individually and working together. I liked uh, the energy of Joe and Gahi, Bryce Cartwright, obviously having some good moments. You mentioned the two front rowers; uh, they were both busy. Uh, off the interchange, probably one of the areas Eels lost the game, I think. Aside from Matt Arthur, who we just gave a, a rap to, and you know, not to, to piss in his pocket there because he's a young kid on debut, but he did have a, a solid game. But Makatoa and Madison probably well below their best. I thought Dury was good in limited opportunities. He only got uh, a small portion of minutes on the left edge but made some good runs. But we talk about the importance of those rotation players and if half your bench isn't contributing as much as they should – then you're going to be losing key moments outside of those opening exchanges, and that's probably where they've got um, Matt, they got Matt Dury down for 31 minutes. Yeah, interesting. I, I didn't think he was on there anywhere near that length of time. Yeah, yeah, because that would have meant um, he would have come on like early in the second half. So, but then again, maybe the flow of the game just went away from the Eels during that time, and you don't notice him as much. But I, I noticed his runs. He had some great runs coming down that left edge, but. Uh, also, they've only got him now for 39 metres, which feels a bit cheap on, on the effort there. Um, yeah, like, you, you can definitely point to some individuals and you can point to some some bad plays. And that really, when you, we're talking about the season as a whole, that really epitomises where the Eels are struggling right now. Uh, but when I look at this game, my anger is not at the team. Like, they, yes, they bottled it. Yes, they, they had some bad plays at the end. But they were also in a game where they should have been multiple tries ahead, essentially, based on the cause that went for and against them. Yeah, it, look, it was... Uh, as I said to you, if this was the um, a game where the Eels weren't putting in the effort, weren't, uh, didn't have some really good, um, impressive moments... Um, maybe it wouldn't be hurting quite as much. Yeah. But it just, you know, it the just famous, feels like... The famous... You know, uh, we, we, there you go. Yeah. Well, I've, we're finding a way to lose moments in games that are significant. And and unfortunately, with the way this year has gone, some of those moments tonight included officiating calls, but we're still finding ways to lose moments ourselves and and it comes down to like you you spoke about um you know not being able to to get onto loose balls now the, some of the some of the passes that went down or the part or, or the balls that went astray the the eels weren't able to um clean it up in any way and that that in itself led directly to those two tries for a start but they also turned over um, 
really cheap possession in attack uh, down on the Knights line. And it and it was a couple of times where I just thought maybe the player just bends their back a bit, you know, or, or, or hits the ground in an attempt to retrieve a lost ball. But, you know, it's sort of like instead the hand just sort of extends down towards the ground and you just end up with a... I mean, it's not a it's not a soft knock on. It's not it's not one where you put the you put the blame on the player who's actually been credited with the knock on. It goes in in these instances. It goes and rightly so to whoever's thrown the loose pass or or you know the fact the balls hit the ground. But you know, it's these are these little um, you know one percent or two percent effort plays. If the ball's on the ground. Wrap it up. Well, you know what, in a way, it sort of inversely epitomizes that is the, uh, and I think it was the Inari Tuala try, the actual try, not the uh, fake try that went up as a try, where we saw two players actually show a bit of hustle to try and dive on the ball, but they ended up hurting each other's chances in Dillbags and Sean Russell off the little grubber kick, and they both dive for the ball in a hustle effort, got in each other's way, ball squirts out, pops up perfectly for Tuala to dive over. It's that's like the opposite of what you're, you're pointing out there, but in the same way, it also points to the same thing where, where they are making the effort, it's even still backfiring. It's just when you're down, you're down. Like, Well, that's why I said there was moments in the game where, um, well, I, at the start, I, I was talking about the, you know, the, the luck's not coming their way. Like, that's an example where, uh, you know, as you said, the hustle was there and they just couldn't make it happen, not through lack of effort, but, you know, and then the ball squeezed out perfectly for the Knights to be able to literally fall on the ball to get the try. It's, you know, it, it just, so many times this year, it's just felt like the perfect storm going against the Eels. And um, tonight it was just really, really frustrating because this goes down as one of the games this year that was uh, eminently winnable. And, and even even would have been had some of the right calls been made because the match probably plays out differently if the tries were awarded that should have been awarded. Um, there, There isn't the mad scramble towards the end um, that we saw. And maybe we don't see two long-distance tries scored against the run of play with the ball being dropped. And, uh, I mean, that in itself sort of highlighted our our lack of, um, well, I suppose elite pace in the back line. But, you know, I mean, I guess what it comes down to, I mean, we're not going to have, we won't have elite pace in our team next year. There isn't anyone with an elite pace that's on the market. There isn't anyone with elite pace. I mean, like, Lomax is clearly going to help, but it's one player. You know? Yeah, yeah. Blaze Talani. He's just has, he has good pace. No, you know, like, he has. He has. Yeah, yeah he, I mean, you're not going to get the hammer. Don't no, get me wrong, no, but but he, he doesn't have elite pace. Yeah, but yeah, you know, we if we keep Blaze and he develops, then you're going to have him and uh, Lomax are going to have plus speed, like good NRL speed, and that might be enough. But the problem is, you know, Guffo's pace is only going down, and you know, the man's been a war horse, and he's clearly playing well below his best in terms of fitness. He is not healthy. You can see that, but. He's not going to get healthier. You know, he's on the the back stretch of his career now. Um, so, and Will, uh, I know you're down in his sixties, but let's talk a best case scenario where he gets back to his best. Will in in that archetype isn't a speedster. He's a wrecking ball center, a power center. So yeah. that that means you've got two guys of good pace in Tawangi and Lomax. Your fullback with a lack of pace. Your one center is a power center. The other center is up in the air. If Bowie stays around, he can be that guy. And again, that's another guy. I've, Solid pace, but not elite NRL pace. So you're, you're left yeah. trying to engineer different attacking structures. Yeah, look, I'm I'm a bit down on Will's game this week, but I mean the you know the other week he just about had a uh, in in um, I think the game against the Sharks he he was one of the best on field. It's you know I just thought tonight was tonight was really one of those games where there was moments that just you know could have been better for him. That's all. Um, and, and look, I mean, the fact remains, they've probably got their back line sorted for next year. I mean, it's, um, 
they they probably need they wouldn't hurt to recruit an extra um, NRL standard back or two. But when it comes to the starting back line, I think I think it is probably sorted. Now the question remains how long someone like Gutho goes around for, because what we saw tonight from Gutho was um, some great moments, like some really, really good moments. Like um, defensively, he was he was really strong. Um, he had some good moments in attack, and I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened with that at the last throw of the dice for us in in that moment because um, he he literally looked confused. When, you know, like, what do I do now? Whether it's because his support players weren't where they were supposed to be, whether he wasn't expecting to be in possession there, I don't know. Um, you know, I figure you're either going to go through the hands decisively or you're going to put in a kick, and it just didn't happen. And, look, I guess that's football, but we just needed to be better because to be only down by two points at that stage and what nearly just under two minutes to go, um, make a contest of that last play. And unfortunately, we couldn't. So, um, yeah, very disappointing, mate. Um, is there anything more you want to talk about with this match? Because... I, I know, could go like, on for about an hour about the officiating, but I'm not going to. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but Defen- a, defensively, it was defensively it was a, a mixed bag. Uh, up, because, yeah, up until the end where we saw... Well, it wasn't... At the end, it wasn't even really... I know that the Knights did score off a series of offloads for the middle uh, in the second half, but I was thinking, like, even at the end, the two Bradman best tries, they weren't actually defensive failures. It was uh, try scoring situations gone wrong for the Parramatta Eels. So it was counter counterattacking stuff. Uh, there were a lot of missed tackle 60s, and I know at half time I think it was about 24 missed tackles, and at full time, end up being a total of uh, where are my defensive stats here? A total of 55 missed tackles, which is terrible in a vacuum. But it felt like they were. Uh, I don't know if that you can call them quality missed tackles, but there was like a lot of effort, you know, trying to corral the Knights back into the inside the field, and you know, slowing them down, and then getting guys in numbers coming after the first missed tackle. So don't get me wrong, it was not a defensive clinic. But there was a lot of effort there. Yeah, well, we had... Um, look, it's funny. Uh, somehow I didn't see it, but Mitch Moses was credited with six missed tackles. Um, I, I think, I, think I, I remember at least two situations where he was in, cut the guy down, but went through off the tackle, and supporters came in to make the... or supporting defenders came in to make the actual clean-up tackle, and that counts as a missed tackle. So yeah, which is a bit rough, but we we still had some high ones in the uh, forwards. Like Brendan Hands is credited with eight missed tackles. Yeah, um, Reg with seven, um, Cardi with five, um, so, which is just you know that's just way. I thought I thought Brendan that was easily his worst game since taking over at the reins of number nine, um, and you know it's unfortunately it came this particular game where the Eels were being very competitive, but. Prior to that, he's been very good. So I'm hoping that next week, because the, the concept of him and Matt Arthur as a dummy half rotation is really good on paper. And it allows the Eels to stay up tempo in attack and, and have you know fresh defenders in the middle. So hopefully he can bounce back from that one because he's been really good prior to this game. Yeah, yeah. It was, and well, I could see, you could see he was sort of starting to flag a little bit in that just before Arthur came on in the latter part of the first half. But um, yeah, it was. As I said, it was a mixed bag because there was some really great defence, especially when they were under assault in the early part of the game when the Knights were getting, you know, set after set attacking in the red zone. And uh, there was uh, penalties and six agains that were found. And uh, I thought the Eels did a great job in repelling it. Um, But, um, yeah, look, I don't know if there's anything too much more that we can... We can say about this game, as I said, um, we're still shooting ourselves in the foot. No doubt, we can't find too we can't find too much in the way of luck, and uh, you know, copped a bit of a raw deal uh, in officiating. And it's, and I think I've, 
I put it down. I put us down with look in the mirror first. Um, but man, the officiating, yeah, that wasn't good. Like look in the mirror first. We still had con- had, had the capacity to win that game on our own merit, but I feel I, I'm I'm a little bit after a game like that. I'm a bit at the other end of the spectrum. Sixties. We've been looking in the mirror a lot this season, um, and when. You've been doing a lot of looking in the mirror and, you know, you're, you're falling short in certain areas. To get kicked in the nuts like that repeatedly by the officials really makes me angry. Um, just call a fair game. Like I said, the the best case scenario tonight is that your referee was grossly incompetent. And that's... Yeah. that's. I mean, we saw Wayne Bennett come out this week and absolutely tee off on the officials because that's the state of the game. And we, we tiptoe around because, again... There, there is absolutely a line where you need to be respecting officials and the job they do, right, especially in junior football, right through to the NRL and origin. But by the same token, things have fallen into such a state of disrepair when it comes to NRL officiating that and, and it's been allowed to fester because of almost like a willful ignorance in, in the protection of the officials by protecting them from criticism. Things are not in a good space in the NRL right now. Um, we, we have officials that feel like they don't know the rules including like that Blaze Talani trial where there was a clear rule change made this year. So even if you didn't think he got it down the first time, if you have your hand on the ball and it rolls, as long as there is no meaningful separation, clear or meaningful separation, it's not considered a lost ball. And yet here we are. So I don't know. Uh, like I said, yeah, I, I, I fought the other way this week because I thought the effort was gutsy. Yeah, they let themselves down, but they shouldn't have been in a position where they were chasing points at the end if the, if the game was caught correctly. Oh look! Uh, absolutely, the effort was gutsy. There, there is, there is not a single player out there tonight where I would say that their effort wasn't gutsy. Not a single player out there. It was. Um, you, you can't look at a game like that um, and and say, oh, this player didn't put in or that player didn't put in because the effort was a hundred percent there. And my only criticism in terms of the effort was, you know, I'd just like to see some of those 1% plays happen a bit better, you know, fall on a loose Yeah, ball, oh, oh, one, you know, yeah and that's, get it. that is and indicative that, of a team that is short on confidence because... What I was going to say is that's indicative of, of a team that's at the top of their game and, and a team that's sitting down at the bottom of the table. That's, that's basically it. And now the Eels are, are clearly on their own down at the bottom of the table and uh, unfortunately it's a it's a reflection of uh, the performance this season and and unfortunately again the points against climb past 30 and it's just you know and and whether whether it was a bit rough some of those you know we still handed 12 points on a platter to the uh, you know, of those of those points 12 points on a platter and you just can't, you just can't go into matches like that. If you if you're going to go and give a twelve point head start in every game, you're you're literally going to lose every game. It's and that's exactly what, unfortunately, that's exactly what we did tonight. Handed twelve points on a platter. But no doubt. Anyway, mate, can we can we very quickly talk about the New South Wales Cup team because last week we saw what, and I kept banging on about it. <laughs> what was arguably the worst game of football I think I've ever seen in my life. And uh, this week they managed to turn their form around and play some extremely good football to win against the Knights away from home. And uh, and that was despite some abominable refereeing yeah. in that grade. Yeah, very, very like ordinary officiating in this game. But the Newcastle Knights went down to the Parramatta Eels to the tune of 30 to 8. Isaac Lumi Lumi bagging a double, as did Jake Tungle, Morgan Harper, and Riley Smith also getting the try sheet. Great effort from Riley Smith as well. Nice little dart from dummy half. He was a late call up for this one and played quite well off the interchange. Uh, Ethan Sanders, Dejan Arcee sharing the kicking duties, going free from six collectively, uh, with Simbins to Lorenzo Molotalo and Sebastian Sua in the 55th minute following the uh, Morgan Harper try, I believe it was. It was. One of the more bizarre things, because it felt like the referee didn't really know what was going on. The commentator certainly didn't. Uh, he had no clue what was going on for that one. Uh, but both teams getting binned. But yeah, the Eels... Well, uh, hang on. You just mentioned the commentator. I have to jump in here. Now, 
I know this is just New South Wales Rugby League TV and they will tend to use uh, probably some regional callers. But if you're, if you're a regional caller and you've got the gig for something like that, Man, don't let your bias show. <laughs> I mean, if, if, when when we've had a when we've you know when we blog and we've had a go at live calling and live calling is not easy, but you and I both had a crack at that. Um, I we we called some lower grade games. I, I actually got to have a bit of a um, experience on New South Wales Rugby League's um, coverage of um, juniors. Uh, football in the Andrew Johns and Laurie Daly Cup matches, and I make no apologies for the fact that I was I was there and I had an element of bias because I was brought in to um, have a bit of background knowledge on the Eels players um, in those matches. So they were looking for someone with a bit of knowledge on at least on one of the teams to come in. But this was New South Wales Rugby League TV. So it's actually, uh, I'm assuming the callers are getting paid for it, even if he's a regional caller from up Newcastle way. But man, some of the calling, <laughs> it was, it, 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 it was literally like, um, I guess the old days when uh, Queensland was in the state of, uh, before state of origin and the Queensland callers would go absolutely nuts if they were any chance of uh, beating New South Wales. And it really felt like that. Like, anyway, I just had to get that out there because I thought that was really ordinary, the the coverage in that respect. So Yeah, and thankfully the Eels were a, better, a bit of a cut above in their own uh, aspect there. Big win over the Knights, 30-8. Um, yeah, it was a case, I feel it was more a case of uh, the entire team playing well here in the 60s. We saw... Some nice play from the halves. Ethan Sanders with a nice kick to Isaac Lumi Lumi. Um, I thought the forwards had a good uh, good table for their spine. Manny Luke and Riley Smith playing off that. Um, we saw some young guns. Jock Brazel getting the start. Uh, we saw oh, Charlie. he played. I thought he played a cracker of the yeah. game, Jock So Brazel. he got the start on the edge. Charlie Glimmer going to lock forward. Saxon Pryke on the yeah. interchange. Uh, Brock Parker, another young guy there playing prop forward. Uh, I, I thought, yeah, it was just a, a good team effort. I, I mean, I'm sure you can single some players out for higher praise, but uh, considering how the team played against the Raiders and how it was collectively probably the worst team effort we'd seen, for the whole team to then bounce back in the way they did is very positive. It's not easy to do. Like, you can talk about putting stuff behind your goldfish memory, move on to the next game, but when you play that bad, it can linger and nag at the back of your mind. And that Newcastle team isn't a, a bad team. Armstrong, Jenkins, Mapapalangi, Cogger, uh, you know, really solid back line there. Some uh, good players in the forward pack as well. Home field advantage, triple header at McDonald Jones. Like, they had a lot to play for here. And the Eels went down or went up the road and uh, got the job done. Yeah, you've mentioned some of the, the play there. I, I I thought it was vindication of playing the younger players mm-hmm, mm-hmm. in uh, this season just to see where... Um, they can take their game to. And I, and as I said already, I think Jock Brazel had a cracking game out on the left edge. And it was left edge, wasn't it? I'm just trying to think the direction of the play. Was it left edge? Anyway, it was, it was out on the edge. Mm-hmm. He, had a, he had a great game. Um, and, uh, and I thought that may have been close to uh, Charlie Geimer's best game of the season he's and he's played some good games but yeah. I, I thought I thought he was really good and the the fact that they went from barely being able to complete a set last week even taking conditions into consideration the way they were able to turn it around this week and uh, the completion I don't know what the percentage of completions what uh, happened to uh, come out as but Last week, what were they, about 48%? Yeah, 46% Please. possession, 48% completion rate last week. And again, that felt generous to the blue and gold. Yes, yes. So to come out this week and, and get the job done as they did, I thought was exceptional. Um, as for individual performances, um, the, you know, Tungor continues to be a surprise packet. That uh, One of the tries that he scored today, I didn't think he was scoring it. It was 
Um, yeah, when he came back to the post, uh, it was a good effort. Um, he, he ended up fighting for a couple of defenders to get the ball over the line. I, I don't know how he actually got there. It was a very strong carry. Yes, yes. Um, and, uh, again, another young player that came up, Riley Smith. Now, we were uh, in the – well, in the uh, bumpers up uh, – sorry, the um, – spotlight article that I wrote this week, I was saying I, I wanted to see players getting a chance, not just in first grade with with Woods and Charlie, but players elevated all through the um, the three grades. So really pleased to see those uh, players like Jock and Riley get elevated. I would have liked to have seen more game time from uh, for Saxon in this particular one. But, uh, yeah, it was really good to see Riley Smith get that try as well. Yeah, uh, it's a good although the commentator, Oh, my the goodness. Uh, what was he saying? Is it, is it a um, double knock-on? Is it a double movement? Double, yeah, double knock-on. Is it a double movement? I, I don't even know how you come out with a comment like that. Like, Don't get me wrong. If he was trying to get out, uh, he was probably trying to get out the double movement uh, comment first. But it was, it was, double knock-on came it was out never, never anything close to a double movement. It was... <laughs> that was that was yeah. the ridiculous thing, and uh, but he was still going with it at, at first um, when they were going into the replay. But yeah, I, I don't even know how he even thought about that. Maybe maybe he wasn't a, was not fully aware of the rules. I don't know. But um, anyway, very pleased to see Rolly Smith getting the try as well. He's he's one of the regular. Um, best performers in the in the flag team and he's also one of those players that is a one percent player yeah like he he puts in the big effort on some of the the small plays where you just you know it might be cleaning up possession it might be getting there and supporting your teammates he's just um absolutely the busiest player out there on the field and i've been told he's He's pretty much the fittest player in the team, so that doesn't surprise. Um, the other, uh, we haven't uh, seen any footage of it as yet. The um, Jersey Fleet team went down, um, what was it, 34 to 18, something uh, like that? I believe it was 34 18, yeah. It was 22 4 at half times, so a bit of a comeback in the second half of the Bourne Gold, but uh, not enough. Down four tries to six, and uh, Arpa yeah. not having a good day off the kicking tee, just one from four making that scoreline a bit more of a blowout. But we knew Newcastle yeah. were a good team coming into this. Third place on the ladder. Uh, very, very strong side. And yeah, it, so they played the first place team and the third place team yeah. in consecutive weeks. So it's been a it's been a tough part of the draw. And it was always going to be a, a big ask for them to get through this part of the draw and, and go on with it after having a 0-7 and seven start to the season. But... Um, hopefully I can give a bit more feedback on that game when we talk in the news podcast through the week. Mate, I, I don't think there's too much more to, to say about this. We we have uh, a Thursday night game, do we not, this week? Yeah, Thursday night versus South Sydney, I believe, who have rounded back into what resembles pretty reasonable form. So bad time for the Parramatta Eels, as is our customary for our squad, whether we're going strong or not. We always tend to find uh, teams in their best moments. And, yeah, got a tough one out there at Combank. So we'll be there for the pregame show, I believe, with our times to be confirmed. But you'll be able to catch us in the bistro, hopefully for Parramatta Eels legend at some point. Um, but you never know for availability. But uh, we, we will be there regardless, me and you holding down the fort out at Combank, out at Parramatta Leagues. Yeah, mate, as always. And, and if there's anyone would like us to uh, ask, any legend a particular question we'll as soon as we know who the legend is and 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 can confirm that we'll uh talk about it in the uh news podcast we'll put it on the socials if you have any questions that you'd like us to direct to the legend just let us know if there's anything you'd like us to address in the podcast also just let us know uh, more than happy to um take any questions and and come up with the answers as best we can or to track those answers down so mate uh thank you for uh, getting through another instant reaction podcast after unfortunately yet another loss thank you to our sponsors star partners real estate Auburn, norellen and Parramatta, for their continued support thank you to you our listeners 
for always being there for us and and for providing all the encouraging feedback that you do. We really appreciate the those people that reach out to us and let us know what they think. Uh, and apart from that, mate, I still got to say it. Go you mighty eels. <laughs>